Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick. I cover the Supreme Court for Slate.com, and I think I've been doing it for 15 years. Well, I think that it's, it's understood that a lot of I almost don't want to say this because I think Justice Ginsburg has really been making news in recent interviews. I mean, I think for a long time it was understood that justices sat for interviews and told you almost nothing you didn't know already. And so the interviews were, you know, you could be the guy who wrote it up or you could be the guy who read it, but it didn't much matter because what they said was not usually something that was groundbreaking. I think that's actually changing and I think one really interesting thing that I haven't given enough thought to is the ways that Ginsburg is starting to use the press, particularly in the last year or two, to talk around the media directly to the public and talk around the court. But I think for the most part, uh, there's long been a feeling that whether you had access or not didn't much matter to anyone but your editor. Right, because I think I think that that and that's that like sort of Maginot line between law and politics really like rests in each of the justices' own heads, and so they have very different notions of what is too much to talk about, you know, justice. And also, I find very interesting, just as an aside, that they until quite recently felt like if they went to Europe, they could say things that they wouldn't say here. You know, it'd be much more political giving a speech in France or England, and you'd be like, internet, right? Like doesn't matter where you say it. So I think it, 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 it uh, uh, moves with individual justices as it moves with, you know, the moment in history. For me, I think the high watermark of, you know, as, as a journalist who's trying to probe this space between law and politics was Justice Scalia's memo when he refused, you know, to recuse himself in the duck hunting case and his incredible, like, I'm just going to put it out there. You know, I'm going to explain to people this utterly political question, right? I mean, this completely political question about whether he was too cozy with a plaintiff while the case was, was pending. And I just thought, Man, what a model for, you know, the thing that doesn't happen every day. This completely political explanation of why he thinks he doesn't have to recuse himself in memo form to the American public. Bring it. Like that was so but that doesn't happen. And I think in a sense what Ginsburg is doing in these interviews is a version of that, right? She's not doing it in memo form, but she's saying, here's something I can't put in a dissent. And I don't want to wait for my memoirs. <laughs> so I'm going to find some roundabout way to talk directly to the American people about what they fully did not appreciate in Hobby Lobby. And I can tell them. And it's very, very interesting because it's, as you know, it's a pretty political conversation. She wasn't just talking about the outcome of the case. She was talking about the composition of the court and why men don't understand things. And that's not a, <laughs> that's not a doctrinal point. Um, I think the risk is, I remember once sitting down and looking at the rankings of the most popular and unpopular justices, and those rankings are almost useless because, you know, you're looking at the 3% of Americans who can even identify a justice. So already, I think, you know, you're looking at numbers that are very skewed. But when you look at the justices from year to year, uh, and I did this about seven or eight years ago, who are least popular, ironically, it's the ones who are most exposed. So the, I, you know, it's, it's the, I think that the risk to justices is they have this notion that if I get out there and I do Sesame Street and I get on, you know, Colbert and I do all this stuff, people will really come to love me. And as all of us know, when you do those shows, people come to hate you. Like there's no win for them in this situation. The more they explain, and I think particularly the more they try to explain that what they do is too complicated to understand, you know, I think that that backfires. And so it seems to me that the risk has been, and I haven't really looked at this systematically, I'm sure someone has, but I think that the risk of putting yourself out there is a lot more people um, come to see the court as partisan and, you know, I mean, I think the backlash to Justice Ginsburg's interview with Katie Couric was as strong as the, you know, notorious RBG uh, love fest. And I think that you come out looking partisan and that's a problem for the court as an institution because you're not supposed to be partisan and I think that's you know the meta conversation Ginsburg's having about retirement is that conversation right how partisan are you oh I'm not that partisan but let me tell you about how much the men are clueless so I think that it doesn't it doesn't redound to their benefit I think the problem is when they're the arbiters of what is relevant and what isn't 
that's the real problem. And so it's one thing to say they don't want to share their gossip with us, they don't want to tell us about their medical conditions, I actually think they should. Um, but there are other things they don't tell us that are really, really important, you know, hugely consequential. And I don't think that, I think the problem isn't that the justices uh, don't bear all to us. I think that would be disastrous. I think we need the black robes and the marble temple and all the illusions that come with it. And on that, you know, I agree with Justice Breyer. Like, that is what the court has. That's it, that mystery. So nobody's seeking to get everything. But I think that there is very crucial information that not just about their lives as individuals, but the workings of the court that we don't get. Uh, and I think that is problematic. And I think that for them to be the arbiters of everything uh, is a real problem. And it, I, you know, the example I always use, and it's not entirely fair, but it, I think it's a pretty good example, was the just deranged audio policy, where for years it was just like, okay, this one gets out, uh, not that one, sorry. You're boring, uh, you know. And that, and the, how was that being decided? And who, and why was the court in the position of deciding some cases are super interesting and important, so they get same day all, uh, uh, audio. Some cases, not interesting. And who is the court, and by what metric do they determine that the American public is interested in a case? And then you come up with this policy, which is just bonkers, in which you say, you know what, we're only going to do same day audio for the cases that are five four screaming at each other ideological cases. What could a worse policy have existed in ter for an institution that's trying to say, you know, we're really boring, nothing interesting happens? You know what you should do? Make people watch the really boring cases and have them understand this is most of the court's docket. And instead they did this thing that seemed to me utterly antithetical to the project of being sort of apolitical and mystified and also just the utter hubris of saying we're going to determine which are the big cases that people want to hear. That was nuts. And that I think was so emblematic of this sort of arrogant posture where like we'll let you know when you need information and what information you need. Yeah. No, I, th I mean, look, they changed the audio policy. The audio policy, after people like me carped about it, they changed it to, you know, fine, you'll get it on Friday night when nobody's listening. Um, and that's, you know, that was the determination. I think each of the justices controls their own, um, you know, certainly their own TV and, and radio and book schedule. And I think that there's probably not a lot of needing to talk to one another about it. I think they have very different notions of what is appropriate. Uh, I think that it's really interesting to me that, you know, Justice Stevens has been criticized, Justice Scalia has been criticized, um, for I think some of the reasons that I alluded to, which is I think that there is an argument that when any justice goes out and does some of this, uh, it makes the whole institution look suspect. And I think that, again, that because that, um, you know, the world has so changed. And so, you know, there was that incident where Justice Alito went and spoke uh, to a conservative group and there was a blogger with a phone who called him out for it. And he just was like amazed that that was news. And so I think undergirding so much of this conversation, there is just this fundamental problem that justices don't understand. There's no such thing as private space anymore. There's no such thing as Europe and America. There's no such thing as on camera or off camera. You know, you can continue to say uh, the speech is off the record, but you know, Justice Thomas's speech at UVA was in Politico the next day. It was off the record. So I think until they understand that, and I think they simply don't, or maybe they're coming to understand that the days of getting to go to secret places and do secret things and say in your capacity as a justice controversial things and not have it reported, those days are over. And so then you have to calibrate, okay, so we live in this new world. I can either do nothing, right, go back to the Brennan days where you just hide out, or I can try to figure out some way to, uh, acknowledging there are no private spaces anymore, to be public and yet to still preserve the integrity of the court. I think that's what you're, you know, the differential you're seeing, you know, the justice suitors who never ever made appearances and never gave interviews and were just profoundly uncomfortable ever being outside the role, you know, of, of oral argument or, or opinion days. And then justices like Ginsburg and Sotomayor who have just like expansive public lives and say anything to anyone and go everywhere and mix with people uh, and understand that nothing is off the record anymore. I think in that continuum, you have a lot of people who are trying to find their way to 
all do the same thing, which is not humiliate themselves, not humiliate the court, but in some way or another be in the public conversation. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think, you know, for Justice Scalia, it often has been triggered by an event, right? So, you know, he wanted to talk about Hamdi, so he talked about Hamdi. He wanted to talk about um, uh, duck hunting, he talked about duck hunting. So often for him, I find, you know, I think he was upset with the gay marriage decisions last year. You know, he would come on top. So I think for him, they, they tend to be uh, efforts to uh, correct the record in a case that he feels uh, folks didn't understand. Uh, I think for Sotomayor something really different is going on. I think Sotomayor, and I think she's unique, at least at this moment on the court, um, I think she really sees her job as being a kind of a national ambassador job. And it's fascinating to me, you know, she, and she said this since the beginning, you know, this was what her book was written for. Her book is not, you know, a deep uh, discursion on constitutional doctrine. Her book is a love letter to young uh, Latina women who come up to her and say, how do I get your, you know, job? And I think she is using her public appearances to uh, kind of act as a role model and to uh, sort of say, here, you know, this is this too could be yours. And it's just a really different, I mean, I think, you know, she's interesting because I think she's just a natural extrovert on a court full of introverts. And I think like she would die if she couldn't go to Costco and mingle with people. She, you know, she'd love talking to Zoe on Sesame Street. Like that's awesome for her. And I think she, does it in different ways. I'm not sure she uh, as much is interested in correcting the record as she is interested in using her uh, incredibly lofty position to break down doors for women and minorities in America. So it's a completely different project. I think Ginsburg is kind of somewhere in between those two poles where part of it is she wants to talk about what she thinks is wrong. And she has, by the way, this is not new. I mean, people think this is about Hobby Lobby, right? She did this after the Redding case, the strip search case. Um, she went on the record with Joan Biskupic and said it, she hated it after O'Connor retired and she was the only justice. She has been very deft at using the media to get across a meta message and to say, you think the Reading case is about this? Here's what it's really about as the only woman on the case, the court. You know, you think that Hobby Lobby was about Rifra? Here's what it's really about for the three women on the court. So that's a very, again, different posture. And so I think, you know, and they're probably the three that are the most out there uh, in ways that I think people find overwhelming. And so I think they're all serving very different ends, and so it's almost impossible to compare what they're doing. Uh, but I think that it's, it's sort of driven by very different psychological imperatives.